I'll uh, introduce Ivana, but uh, Craig, when you start speaking, you'll have to introduce yourself a little and give us a little background. Ilana was born in and raised in Kenora, then moved away for several years, traveling extensively and living a fairly nomadic lifestyle before and after living in Edmonton for eight years. She has settled in Kenora again since the pandemic. She has a sociology degree and certificates in peace and, peace and post-conflict, ASL, and permaculture. Now, Alana, when you start speaking, you could explain with it, what ASL and permaculture is for the group. Um, Alana worked with newcomers to Canada for many years, bridging cultures and understanding between different world experiences. She's been working with the street family in Kenora for about a year now and absolutely loves the community. Doing this work makes Kenora feel like home. And uh, with that, I'll actually maybe uh, have uh, Craig give us a little bit of his background. Hello, uh, my name is Craig. I am from Wajashkinigam from uh, Red Portage. Uh, I was born here. I was raised here for the first four years of my life, and then I moved to Winnipeg. Uh, kind of got involved in the system, so I was all over my whole life. So I've been everywhere from Hamilton to Vancouver, back to Winnipeg. So, uh, and then essentially, I just found myself, you know, coming back home when I was about twelve years old, and or I think I was eleven, eleven or twelve. So, and uh, yeah, I've just been here ever since. Kind of, uh, you know, removed myself from the system, um, and I've been on my own since. So I just yeah. I haven't been helped. Uh, I've, so I, you know, just recently kind of straightened my life out. Uh, I think it was like two years ago, three years ago. I stopped drinking and you know doing whatever, living the life of uh, I guess uh, of. What happens after being involved in a system that's uh, meant to kill you, I guess. Uh, I woke up and then I just started helping people uh, that were on the streets and realized um, just, uh, there's no one to help them. So I just really just started helping and I came home. Uh, something always made me come home. Um, so I'm just here. It's a place I've always ran away from too, is a lot of problems started. So I've come home to, you know, help myself and then help other people. So I'm just here to, to do that. So, thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. So uh, now we'll get on with our, our talk today with um, Alana and uh, Craig. It's all yours. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to share a screen here. I can figure out how to do this. That work? Yeah, cool. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're Craig and Alana, and we're two members of a coalition called Kenora Moving Forward. Uh, so Kenora Moving Forward. <laughs> uh, we are an informal open group of community members and organizations concerned about homelessness and underlying issues of racism, poverty, mental health, and addictions in the Kenora area. We recognize that these are communities that need to be addressed together, not just as a social service level. Yeah, so we're... I group of people who are, are passionate about what's um, going on um, and we thought it was worth sharing some statistics about uh, homelessness here in Kenora. Um, so in the whole district, um, according to the 2018 uh, count that KDSB did, there's 393 unhoused, um, 223 of those are in the city of Kenora. Um, we're seeing a really young demographic on the streets these days. So about 34% um, of the folks out there are between the ages of 25 and 35. Um, and this is pretty accurate uh, according to who we, we see accessing 
like our services when we do like warming spaces and, and uh, dinners and things. The Fellowship Center serves about 120 individuals under the age of 34. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of how young um, people are out on the street, uh, people who have um, aged out of care, who've been in the system, who um, are yeah, survivors of intergenerational trauma, um, and who are you know struggling with quite hard drugs and, and things on the streets and being introduced to those at you know quite a young age. Uh, Ninety percent of the folks identify as indigenous, um, and so I think this is something important to, to take note of, especially when we talk about reconciliation and and land back. If ninety percent of the people on the street um, are indigenous, it, it's this indicator of you know how we've pushed people out and how they don't really belong um, here. And I think it's like intergenerational trauma versus uh, intergenerational wealth, where it's the high high housing costs and low basic vacancy rates, whereas you know people own these properties and lands that are given to them by their forefathers that you know that are profited off the land and we see that suffering on the streets that where you know, that profit came from. It was profit before the people, and now we need to change that around to bring you know, the people before the profit. So we need affordable housing, and we need you know, social housing to help each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that kind of, it's a good segue kind of into the like high housing costs, low vacancy rates, and long waiting lists for social housing creates higher risks of homelessness. And this. This isn't anything like radical. It, it totally makes sense, but uh, we definitely are seeing this in, in Kenora. Um, and so um, homelessness is complex issue. Um, so it has many different facets to it. And then it includes things like trauma, addictions, and mental health challenges. Um, and it has a significant impact on the ability to achieve other um, outcomes like health, justice, education, um, and employment. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to look at it as a complex issue, but also understand how it, how it connects with so many other things. Uh, so the values that Kenora Moving Forward um, likes, to, likes to live by, but <laughs> the values that we um, use are Indigenous centered. So for us, it's really important that um, indigenous culture and, and values are um, considering that 90% of um, folks on the street are indigenous. I think bringing culture back is, is something that lots of people identify as, as something that has been a uh, important for them in their in their healing journey. And so um, I think it's important for us to to center that. And that's you know the, the, the big demographic that we've. That we help is yeah it's obviously it's uh, first nations but then also you can see by the pictures as uh, there's a various amounts of talents that are you know still out there and we're we're helping people we're empowering them to, to utilize their gifts and you know, giving them these safe and free spaces to uh, feel free and humanized instead of these uh, you know institutional type settings that are otherwise traumatic because you know i myself find these settings traumatic for myself because of, you know, of growing up in a system and as well as my mother being a residential school survivor, I did not know that, you know, going into churches and places like that made me feel, you know, odd, but then that's something that's a traumatic effect for my mother. So <clears throat> that's something that we need to consider, and, you know, the people that we help. So we need to have cultural immersion as well as you know, cultural diversity. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also think it's really important to be um, led by those who are living um, uh, whatever whatever we're trying to do. Like I, I know I'm <laughs> caught all the time. I you know I think we have this great idea, and then I go and chat with someone and and present it, and they're like, oh yeah, that's a good idea, but why don't you do this? And I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. That is much better. Right. It's really humbling just to know that I, I, I'm, I'm not the expert in this. People who are living it, like they know their situations, everyone's situation is different. And so, um, you know, we need unique 
um, and varied options um, for people, but also knowing that they they ultimately know way, way better than we do what's what's needed and how we're going to make sustainable change um, and really actually make a difference um, in people's lives and not just you know, these little helpful Band-Aid solutions. Um, thinking big but keeping it simple is something that uh, we're... Uh, please have Craig speak louder. <laughs> um, I think we like to think big. We've got lots of big ideas, um, but it's important then to uh, put put it into action and uh, and not just continually talk about it. Um, and then the other part of, um, of who we are as a coalition is a community of you know people with all sorts of different backgrounds and and skills and connections. Um, and putting that all together is where one of our strengths come from. Is um, yeah, knowing that we're we can tap into everyone's resources. Okay, keep button. So um, over the last what, year and a half or so, um, we've done a variety of different um, different things. We started uh, one of our first events um, that we kind of worked together on as a coalition was a four day sacred fire, four days, four nights, the fire burned. And um, it was a really great opportunity, A, for the community um, to come together and to show support for those on the street. And I think um, it was a very visual, people on the street could see um, how the community was coming together. Sometimes, you know, there's there's organizations doing things and there's funding here and there's this and that, but um, <clears throat> for those on the street to actually see that care and that love and that um, support was really important. Um, but it was also a really great opportunity just to sit around the fire and, and chat with each other and um, really listen um, to what was going on and what was needed. And this provided sort of a base for us to, to move forward with and understand kind of what would be helpful. Um, so we've done a fair amount of advocacy over the past year in regards to several different things. Um, this summer, one of our big ones was washrooms and access to washrooms. Um, it's something that those of us with homes don't often think about, but if you don't have a home and you don't have constant access to a washroom, um, it, it's, it's problematic, especially in, um, like COVID times when it's, it's hard to, to go into businesses um, just to use a washroom. Um, we've been providing dinners daily for a while now, first of all, in the warming spaces, um, and then uh, with the cooling station and we continue, there's a, a network of volunteers that, that cook. Um, many of them are church groups, but uh, like TA teachers have a group and there's, there's many different kind of volunteer uh, clusters that that cook dinners for us and we we serve those um, in a variety of different places right now we're serving kind of down on the harbor front and, and delivering meals around town um, but last winter we opened up um, a couple of warming spaces so we heard that there's this this gap after so fellowship center is open from 8 a.m until 4 p.m and then there's not really good place for people to go after 4 p.m. Um, and then the shelter opens at 8.30. Um, and so uh, many people do go to the shelter. Um, we hear there's usually around 15 to 25 people um, in the shelter um, and they, they provide a dinner there. Um, but that means there's lots of others who, who don't access that. Um, at dinner. So we've been providing dinners and then providing this warm space because that five hour gap um, in time, it's really, it, it's, it's a long time to be outside when it's cold. Um, and so we open up these warm welcoming spaces. It, it, I mean, it's more, it's more than just warmth. It's about, you know, a place where people know that they, they can hang out and not be, you know, shuffled along, that they know they belong there um, and they're not going to be, be judged or, um, looked at, but it's, it's a place where there's, there's friends and, um, 
you know, people that they can, they can trust and um, that can help connect them to resources. Um, they can access Wi-Fi and internet. They can access a place to plug in their um, cell phone and devices to charge. They can access a washroom, uh, running water. All of these things are, are, uh, are helpful. Um, and I think it's more than, more than just a warming, warming space. Um, and then in the, in the summer, we realized, oh, it's not just the cold weather that um, is dangerous to people's health. As we watched what was happening over in the West and, and the heat wave come through, we realized that we also had to, to make sure people were safe in the heat. And so we opened up a cooling station um, and uh, maintained that for, for six weeks. And, you know, primarily as a place, again, of, of belonging, where people knew that they could come and, and check in, they could get a bottle of water. Um, and they could hang out with us. We had, you know, a chessboard and a football and, and things like that. Um, and then we've done a variety of different collaborative events. So July 1st, we did a, um, uh, what was it? It's like a truth and reconciliation um, event. Uh, we, we partnered with uh, different, different organizations and we, we kind of play the role of, um, like we put together a poster that highlighted all the different events in town that were going on. And so sort of this, uh, different people had different, uh, um, you know, individual events, um, but sort of tying those, those together. Um, and that was similar to what happened um, a few weeks ago with the September 30th um, healing and, and reconciliation event. Um, do you want to maybe talk about that a little? Well, I guess the community <clears throat> week of healing and reconciliation uh, just showed that we could uh, all get to, uh, all the organizations. Uh, common goal. It just showed that yeah, that we were coming together to heal and really, really put together very quickly. Uh, yeah, it was just in a matter of weeks, and it was just. You know, beautiful to see how many people came together and all working together just for this uh, week. But again, it was just a, a, something that was um, that it's going to be grown, and, that, and that's kind of where the, the everyday Friday, the Friday fire has grown from. Is uh, you know that. That we do need that, that um, I guess, um, um, cult cultural immersion um, in downtown, especially because that's where a lot of, a lot of people are. Like a lot of the culture was taken, and that's especially the people that are in town aren't necessarily, we're not allowed or welcomed on our own reserves because of you know, just the, the way social behaviors are. Is, you know, some of the people are in power or they're, they're colonized themselves so that we're you know, alienated from our own communities. So and we make our own communities. So, you know, there's a saying that misery loves company. That's why a lot of people get together in these circles and these, these towns and cities and under bridges because, you know, necessarily they're just living off love and you can't live off love and societies that uh, want to divide and conquer. And that's what treated a, a little more kindly and more with more love and compassion and this week it just showed that we could all come together to do that so i think every day every every week friday that shows more support for community members that are in need mm -hmm. yeah no i i totally see that sense of belonging and and the importance of the people in the community. Um, sorry. <laughs> Don't talk about that? No. Um, so the goals of Kunar moving forward, um, I think we're able to, to narrow them down to kind of four general goals. So the first one is that every individual in Kunar who wants a home has a home. Um, and I, I think there's, there's many different players that, um, are going to make this happen. You know, KDSB has a really important role to play um, in, in this regard. And so we, 
we tend to do, a, a, you know, advocacy and, and, and talking to them about kind of making, getting, getting this, this one done. Um, whereas the next one, we feel that Kenora Movie Fort has, has more of a role in playing. So everyone in Kenora Streets has a safe, welcoming place to go free judgment at any time of day. And so this is where we've done the warming spaces and the, the cooling station. And, and we're hoping to open up a space again um, as, as the cold weather so cold weather is upon us. Um, community resources are simple to navigate flexible, creative, and responsive to individual situations. The service providers acknowledge and address gaps. Um, I think this is fairly self-explanatory. I think there's a lot more we can, there's a lot of services in Kenora um, already. And I know that there's a lot of good things going on, but it doesn't always translate into um, services that people are accessing or that they're able to access in easy ways. And um, yeah, I think that we can make some some improvements here. Um, and then the last one is is that the root causes um, of I mean we've had street people um, in Kenora for a very long time, um, and I think it's more than just you know that we don't have enough houses in Kenora. We need to really recognize and address what what the root causes of of this is um, and. We believe that things like racism and colonial worldviews really are um, one of the uh, main issues. And it's something that we as a community, we as a society um, need to come together and, and work on. So what are our next steps? So Craig's got a bunch of them. <laughs> So, I'll pass them over. so we've been uh, kind of we've been working with uh, an off-grid healing uh, camp. Um, so so far uh, we have a Treaty Three Justice, we have Nietzsche Bail Program, and Changes Recovery involved in bringing bringing residents out for day programs. So um, with this, uh, we've uh, been able to create. <laughs> Something called a reeducational program. Reintegrational entrepreneurship, I guess. Oh. It's a program, but uh, it's, it's written differently. Um, but uh, so, so far, we, we've been able to, um, we've done catering gigs, we've uh, got firewood, we're doing an iron forge, we uh, do peer support and security. Uh, in the seasonal months, we're going to be doing. Um, maintenance for uh, snow removal uh, we have a sawmill so we'll be doing our own lumber so we're just creating our own uh, essentially creating our own jobs for for uh for our community members that, uh, that partake that you know that are willing to partake in, in, uh, in any of these job training skills that we that we're providing um so out at the camp where we're doing trapping and hunting uh, we have a farm we have 80 80 different birds we have chickens uh, geese, turkeys, uh, we also have pigs, um, and yeah, we're just, uh, it's an off-grid farm, just, just uh, off of Middle Lake Road, so it's like 10 kilometers outside of Kadara, if that, um, yeah. So yeah, uh, we have uh, two, uh, we have three people living out there on, on, on the land, uh, I myself, yeah, we've just been doing this for, this is our first year running it, and uh, this is something that uh, a lot of, we have actually two community members that were living on the street, living out there now, and that have been sober, sort of uh, you know, leading a sober, sober life now. And uh, so this is, you know, a program that works. It's not even a program, it's just, it's, it's just what, you're treating humans like humans, and it's what works. And, people want is essentially they don't need a big lavish home they just want a place to call home and to be loved and to you know nurtured and this is kind of something that we're demonstrating that can be done without a million dollars we're doing this just off of the money out of our own pocket so, you know. so we're really focused on right now is this this community center um and as as the cold weather comes in it's it's becoming more and more urgent, I guess, to get get this up and running. Um, 
but the community center is a place I, I think of it as like a safety net um, if if we can't provide homes, if we as a community really can't do that for our citizens, then we need to provide something. It's only fair to, to have a place where they can, they can go. Um, and so the safety net hopefully will, will catch them from falling um, and crashing, but you know, help, help them get back on their feet a little quicker. So it'll be a place where um, they can shelter from the elements, access the washroom, access Wi-Fi, um, storage, connect with you know, caring people, um, and a place to build friendships, really, um, a place where we can connect with each other um, at, you know, different socioeconomic classes, um, different races, and, and it can be a welcoming space for everyone. Um, um, so ways to get involved. Um, I think there's, you know, there's some simple ones like join the Facebook page or mailing list to keep in touch with us and, um, you know, different opportunities for, for volunteer staff will, will come up. Um, and so that's, that's a good way. Uh, come hang out with, with Craig and folks at the Debois Shkode, the Truth Fires, Fridays at the, the fellowship. Um, it's a really great opportunity to just, you know, sit around and, and chat with folks who maybe you don't typically in your everyday lives. Um, and then there's, contributing to the community center um, itself or the back to land programs that that Craig was talking about. And I think this can take um, several different forms. I mean, there's financial con contributions, there's, um, you know, using your networks right now, we're looking for looking for the space for the community center. We've got, you know, some some ideas. Um, the ideal space hasn't come about yet. But if you know, you're someone who is well networked and potentially knows some places that might be suitable like please do let us know um you know ask around ask your friends um it's a community effort um and then there's you know things that the back to land programs um could use lumber and tools and canvas drop sheets and different things for their their projects um and so i'm sure craig would be interested in chatting further if you have um you know potentially access to to those types of things to donate um, and then there's the things that we can all do, um, you know, especially as a as a, a white settler, it's it's up to um, me and, and and you to really change some of these narratives that are that are fueling our issues. You know, as we were talking about, um, you know, racism and and stuff fueling um, homelessness and and the unwelcomeness often in our community. I think it's important for us to. Um, for all of us to, to, to speak out and, and to be um, speaking or speaking the truth. Um, and then also for us to be, um, you know, be welcoming to, to people and to acknowledge them as, as, you know, humans and, and friends and, and acknowledge those we pass, pass on the street because, uh, you know, unwelcoming looks have, have impact on people. Um, and so do small acts of kindness. Um, you know, I hear people talking about a small act of kindness, being bought a coffee or just being given an encouraging word, you know, years later, it still has an impact on them. So I wouldn't underestimate what um, just small acts of kindness can do. Anything else you want to talk about? So if you want to contact us, canalmovingforward at gmail.com um, is probably the best way. Mm -hmm.